I'll, I'll start giving you some context that motivated me to think about uh, who counts and more importantly, who decides who counts. And um, one of the motivations you can see here for several years, I had fun in the summertime to uh, look at Google image search and um, to search for the term university professor, which um, provided some surprising diversity, but not necessarily on the dimension that I was looking for. And um, then I gave this presentation in summer of 2019, and someone in the audience said, well, this is not what it shows for me. And indeed, I looked it up four days after I made the, the, the slide back then, and then it looked totally different. Now, what was interesting for me as a service statistician that this um, set of images, which stayed pretty stable, stable in that way for the days and weeks to come, is from a statistician perspective also now more diverse, but not a representation of reality in that sense. Um, a little more so here in the US than in Germany, but I'm hard pressed to find a university that has about a 50-50 uh, split between male and female university professors. And if, if you know a place, <laughs> let me know I might want to move there. You're welcome. Um, so, so that was sort of interesting, you know, because the people I mentioned yesterday that I train and deal with a lot, um, we are looking for alternative data sources to learn about the world, you know, to, to not always ask and uh, use survey data. Uh, this collection here certainly is not one. And, and what, what's clear from this to an audience like you is, well, someone behind the scenes made a decision and now it looks different, right? It looks different in a way, you know, that's sort of nice for me, but it is, you know, a decision made somewhere in this process of data that come in, the way the analysis are done, and what is displayed at the end. And, you know, I eventually um, met uh, the woman who headed that team at Google that was involved in these uh, decisions and, you know, uh, discussions there. One of which was, you know, who are the groups <laughs> to count, who are the groups to look out for. And, and, and obviously the intention to talk more to um, social scientists to, uh, to, to get a handle on, on the relevant groups. But this is, those kind of decisions aren't the only ones. There are also people making decisions in whether they contribute their data or not and what data we have to begin with. And uh, a lot of decisions in the application of these ML algorithms and my understanding was there was quite a bit of hands-on discussion last week in the summer school, so you guys probably also made a lot of decisions. And I want to show you um, the result of different decisions uh, in an example of some work we did recently as part of the Institute for Employment Research that uh, Cynthia mentioned. Um, the IAB, the Institute of Employment Research, like many other organizations, is sort of tempted by the idea that one could use the richness of administrative data that they have on job histories of people to predict how successful they will be in a certain uh, qualification program or, you know, assigned to a certain job or what have you. And they're particularly worried about long-term unemployment and try to find ways to sort of allocate resources to the long-term unemployed for those that will actually be successful and not those that were sort of everything, all, all hope is lost. Of people. Now, this is the data set we're using here is um, employment histories and unemployment histories since 1972 in Germany. So, you know, obviously lots has changed over time there, you know, something to remember as you guys do a, a temporal training. But the time aspect aside here, what we were looking at are decisions on in blue and orange, what you see here, decisions on different policies implied on how many people should be helped or supported. But more importantly, all the small dots in the box plots are different decisions on what type of algorithms and a series of tuning parameters. So just, you know, your normal decision making as you do the analytic task. And what was interesting to us, or maybe not surprising to you now having heard all these talks, is that groups like the 
non-German born male or the non-German born females, you know, smaller in size, less information in the data set, are even more susceptible to uh, these decisions in the sense that the performance scores, whether this is accuracy or F1 score for these predictive models, vary a lot depending on what um, decision you end up having made, right? But this is something that normally doesn't make it into the reports. You know, you don't see this kind of sensitivity and, and, and certainly not, I mean, sometimes on the margins, but often not on the internet sectionality or, you know, you can imagine even more subgroups that we didn't even look on. So this is just to illustrate, yeah. Falka, could you just clarify exactly what the, what's being shown in the chart? Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, so, um, it was too fast here. Um, so the, each chart is a performance score. On the left side, it's accuracy. Um, so we are, you know, looking at uh, the um, proportion of correctly classified observations. And on the right side, we are looking at the F1 score, balancing precision and recall on the positive cases. So these are two metrics. You know, if you look at, you know, prediction and, and truth, if you will, as a two by two table and, and uh, different ways to summarize that table. And um, what you see in these box plots, so this is, you know, box plots are a way to uh, show distributions, um, with the majority of the cases, 50% being in the box, and then the viscous show the distribution, basically, right? You can, they, we, we saw a lot of bell curves earlier in, in various shapes. This is a different way to show that. These dots, these observation in it are runs of the model with its outcome with the different decisions. So whether you do a, you know, boosting, whether you do a logistic regression, whether you use a tuning parameter of, you know, a certain way or not. So these are the different dots in the graph. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So, but this is just, just for context. This, it, this one here obviously is a, a prediction task in the way that uh, we just have seen it. For, for me, the setup or for us, the setup is most often not necessarily an individual person prediction and an action taken on an individual, in, for example, in the case of assigning a, a job training program, but more the evaluation of is a policy that I'm trying to implement working and worthwhile doing overall, right, which by definition, if I look at overall, I'm interested in what's often called an average treatment effect or an average effect for the population. But, um, of course, it can be, as we will discuss in a moment, of interest whether um, that holds for subgroups as well, as well, and who are these subgroups. Um, what ha usually happens is you evaluate either using surveys or using an experiment, depending on which world you're in and whether you're allowed to do experiments. But what's usually the case is that in practice, you do not have the chance to sample the cases for your experiment at random from the population. You usually have to rely on volunteers, or luckily, we have to rely on volunteers when we do experiments. And in surveys, it's easier to randomly sample from the population, but since this is also a voluntary endeavor, not everyone participates, and I end up having biased samples, and then I still try to learn something from that for the validity of um, my, my policy program. And so I want to, you know, talk briefly about two approaches, you know, one post hoc approach and one design approach uh, um, on, on uh, you know, how one, one can tackle problems in the fact that, that the data that you have going in might not be as good as the ones you would need to make that generalizability. And so the first one, yesterday someone said, oh, these post hoc fixes, like we fix the population, we fix the proportion of different subgroups. And, and it was, it made me feel bad because that's what I do all the time. You know, I try to fix, the, of course I'm not trying to fix <laughs> people in some way, but we are trying to sort of reweight who, not, not deciding who counts, but who counts how much. That's basically what's going on in a reweighting um, situation. And um, this, we already heard earlier, is uh, using multi-calibration um, to uh, use something called universal adaptability. 
joined the work with Shafi Goldwasser, Christoph Kern, Michael Kim, and, and Omar Rangon. So the inference challenge that you have in these situations is often is that you have, you know, in, in your survey, labeled data, you collect data on X and Y on a subset S, but then you're trying to make an inference for a larger set, you know, the whole country or a different time point. And, um, and, and so the, 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 the classical guarantees that statistics gives us, they, they are not valid here. We are, you know, predicting out of, um, uh, out of range, if you will. And, and so the, the, and the problem we often have is because our data as we collect it is, we know often bias, or we don't know how much bias there is, but it could be, we are trying to adjust or reweight. And traditionally what statistics did or still does is that you reweight to a population that, where you know how the distribution looks like. Right? So you have a single source, the, our survey data or experiment, and then I want to reweight. and actually the survey statistician called that calibration too. We want to calibrate to a distribution of the population where we know the distribution of covariates, also uh, their um, combination or intersectionality as we had it. But the problem is that's to one specific population. Right? And again, if I want to then apply, uh, you could argue, well, I might have settings where um, that doesn't hold. I'll come to that in a second. The way this works usually is that you estimate um, on the combined sample, and then you reweight according to the distribution of the covariates in the target population. Right? That those are two steps in this propensity uh, score approach. The challenge with that is, overall it's fine, but there have been many papers, this is one from Green and Stewart from 2014, where, um, you know, they look at what happens when you do this, what happens to subgroups, right? But in this case here, these are um, propensity score adjustment for a comparison of outcomes of um, uh, women in, in, for different health behavior, and the odds ratio um, that, you know, an, uh, a, a treatment is effective um, compared over different ways to do this propensity score classification. So, so it, even this, so this method is established, it's not at all established how you deal with this intersectionality, right? It's, and, and I mean, you can see, luckily, the confidence intervals all overlap here, but there is variation depending on how you decide you do the matching, right? How you do the propensity score. So, this brings us to, uh, you know, similar to what Guy was saying earlier to the setting, well, maybe we can do better, maybe we cannot be so scripted in deciding how, which combination of groups, which intersectionality we look at, but we look at all of them, and all of them that are possibly relevant, which also then allows us to not adjust to a specific target where we know the distribution, but to all possible targets, um, or, if you will, an unknown target. And, and this would, you know, uh, could be a sit setting, for example, where uh, at, at UCLA we have a study and then we want to uh, transport that re those results all across the country. The reweighting, doing this for a single target is costly. This one here can be much more efficient, and the goal is to provide a universal format. This gives us what we call a target independent inference, and just to compare these two, in the propensity score setting, we, have, we need the unlabeled samples from S and T, and the labeled samples from S in the target independent inference, we just need the labeled samples from S and the unlabeled samples from T, so easier. And then an analogy to the fairness goals that we heard earlier, in the fairness settings, we try to protect the subpopulation from miscalibrated predictions. Here, our statistical goal is to ensure unbiased estimates downstream when we do this for other targets. And we use, um, you know, multi-calibration for that because it identifies all qualified subpopulation in the um, fairness setting and for us, potential shifts in the distribution of these. And, uh, you know, if you have fun reading that paper, you can take a closer look at the proof uh, and uh, the guarantee this gives. 
So this is the postdoc approach. Very briefly, completely different design approach that I want to mention here. As I said, we have this issue that when we have data from different sources, people might not respond. They might just not be there. I don't know anything about them. Right? And so in, if, if, if you can't reweight because you don't even know where to go, right? You could also say, like, well, maybe you can collect more data going in from those that we have. And so um, what's called, you know, often referred to as human social sensing is an approach where you collect data not just about the person, but about the network or the people around them uh, to whom they talk. And this has been used, for example, in election polling and um, capturing voting intentions, where traditionally you would have a single question of the type, if you were to vote in the election, which candidate would you choose, um, or some version of that. And in this human social sensing approach, you would ask about the social context, you know, friends and families and colleagues, not anyone, you, I mean, not your estimation of the population as a whole, but a set of people closely around you, um, and uh, give your estimate about them. And, and if you look on the right side here, two graphs, uh, charts of sort of the, the prediction in the Trump versus Clinton election and uh, this um, social sensing approach uh, is the one on the uh, bottom where the, the overturn, I mean, that, that Trump uh, had, has a higher probability of winning was predicted much more early than uh, it, or actually in the traditional approach, it wasn't picked up uh, until the election, as you might very well remember. We've also used this in the COVID context with uh, case, uh, cases with, where it makes even more sense that you miss the relevant people, right? Those sick might just not be answering your survey, duh, you know, and then you could miss out easily. So instead of asking just about yourself, you can ask, do you personally know anyone in your local community who is sick with a fever or either cough or difficulty breathing? Now, we're missing here all the covariates for privacy reasons, you know, there's good reason not to ask those things, but if the initial cases are sampled at random and you, your intention is to get the important outcomes on everybody, then this could be an interesting approach. And we have seen this works, this is way too hard to read for this small screen that I want to just highlight that um, we have evaluated this approach in a large-scale survey uh, that we ran globally for two years. And, and across uh, many, many countries. And so postdoc, we are able to see how well that matches the cases. And we did see that this community COVID-like illness helped a lot. So to close out in my last minute here, um, in order for either one of these approaches to be successful, we need a lot of transparency on how the data is collected that we try to calibrate to or that we are using for these other approaches. And it came up yesterday in the discussion a little bit. It does matter how these questions are asked. It does matter when they are asked. It does matter how they are recorded. It does matter how they are transformed. And so I want to point you to two reports from the National Academy of Science, one on transparency in statistical information that came out last year. And this new one here that came out this year on measuring sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation, some of you might already know it. And the third one, there's a new working group on the implication of using multiple data sources um, for major survey programs that tr also tries to check, tackle this problem that if I do combine data from different sources, I inevitably have them measured in different ways, and yet I do try to uh, take advantage of these calibrations or otherwise uh, attempts to, to cover all relevant subgroups. So I encourage this community to talk to these guys because I know that those folks working in government really are trying hard to get this right, and, and, but it requires a community of critical people to be engaged in that conversation. So thank you.